For the last two videos of this course, we're actually going to finally get into the last two techniques for solving actual equations. This video is going to be how, about how to solve linear equations. This is going to be a two-part video. The first part is going to be a lot of theory to define the terms and understand what's going on with the linear equation. The second part is going to be the actual practice of solving, which turns out to be a lot cleaner and simpler than all of the theory. So stick with me for the theory and understand sort of how these are put together, but know that all of these steps are not steps we're going to have to replicate every time we solve. A general linear equation has this form with coefficient functions a, b, and f. However, I can divide, divide by the coefficient function a of t as long as I'm careful about denominators and domain. And if I divide by a of t, then I can write it in this form, and the conventional names for these two coefficient functions are capital P and capital Q. So I have a derivative, I have P times the function y, and I have Q with no y's on the right side of the equation. Solving linear equations is sort of a two-step process. I first look at the homogeneous solutions, then I look at the generous, general solutions. The homogeneous solution to a linear equation is what happens if I replace the Q on the right with zero. These are sort of like the base case, and you'll see later in the video how the general case is built up out of the base case. Homogeneous linear equations are really, really nice because I can just solve them as separable equations. I take the P of T Y to the left, or to the right rather, and then I separate. I divide by Y, I integrate in Y on the left and in T on the right, the integral in y on the left gives me a logarithm. The integral on the right is just the integral of whatever p of t is. So I'm not going to say anything more specific about it. I'll just leave it as an integral. And then I take the exponential to get rid of the logarithm on the left. Uh, I have a log exponential of a sum on the right. So e to this integral plus c, that splits up into a product. I'll have e to the c as one of the pieces of the product. And in the standard way that we sort of simplify the constants, I'll just write that as c instead of e to the c. Then I have this exponential with an integral inside it. And that looks sort of weird, but yeah, I can deal with an exponential with an integral inside it. And this is the general solution of the homogeneous equation. You'll notice I've dropped the absolute value bars on y. Whether y is positive or negative is going to depend on the constant c. So that's going to be worked out in initial conditions. So the constant C will take care of both the positive and negative cases. All right, that's how I solve the homogeneous case. Homogeneous case is where I ignore Q and replace it with zero. What about the general case where there is a Q? Well, in order to get to that case, I have to do something with linear operators called superposition. So I'm going to write the left side of this linear equation as a differential operator. So what happens on the left? The derivative plus multiply by p. Well, I can write that as an operator, d over dt plus p. And then the left side can just be written the linear operator L applied to the function y. Again, the function y is the thing I'm looking for. So the equation becomes Ly equals q. What function has this property? This is a linear differential operator because it breaks up over sums and can pull out constants. This is what linearity always is. Things are linear if they break up over sums and work well with constants. So that also applies here. And that's going to be very important in this setup. So let's say that f is a solution to the general equation. Lf equals q. That's the full general differential equation. And g is a solution to the homogeneous equation. Lg equals 0 if you replace q with 0. So say I have these two solutions. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write f plus some multiple of g. This is called a superposition of solutions. In general, in mathematics, when you have these linear combinations, particularly when there are functions that are waves, not that these necessarily need to be waves, it's called superposition. That term is used generally here, even though the functions are not necessarily waves. So if I apply the linear operator to f plus alpha g, where alpha is just some constant, it splits up over addition. And I get LF plus a alpha LG. But LG is a solution to the homogeneous. So LG is 0, so this term just goes away. So I get LF. And LF is equal to Q. So then this whole thing, F plus alpha G, is also a solution to the original equation. Because when you apply the linear operator to it, you get Q. That's what the original equation says, LY equals Q. 
I'm going to give these f and g names. f is going to be the particular solution, yp, so a special solution to the non-homogeneous equation. And g is going to be the general homogeneous solution, so g is going to be yh. And in general, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to look for a superposition of a particular and a homogeneous solution. That's the general approach to solving these linear equations. I already know how to find the homogeneous solution. We did that earlier in the video. So how do I find the particular solution? That's something we don't know how to do yet, and that's actually the hard part. There is a general technique here called variation of parameters, and I want to introduce that to you. I want to introduce it because we're going to use it later in the course. So I want you to have a sense of what it is about, even though we're not going to use this directly when we actually get to examples. So the superposition had a particular plus a multiple of the homogeneous. Well, what if I think about the particular as a multiple of the homogeneous, but instead of a constant multiple, a multiple where the factor is itself a function? So I can think of the homogeneous of having a parameter, that alpha in the previous slide, alpha times the homogeneous. And that parameter was a constant, just a number. And now I've replaced that parameter with some function g. I've added a variable to it. I have varied the parameter, hence the term variation of parameters. Variation of parameters always happens when you take some constant parameters in some situation and turn them into functions to see what happens. Why am I doing any of this? Because it works. <laughs> This is part of a really strange but super common, sorry, super common uh, way of solving differential equations where I, I really don't know how to solve the equation just by looking at it. It seems difficult to approach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to guess that the solution has a particular form, in this case, g times yh. And then I'm going to see, well, if it has that particular form, can I figure out the details? In this case, can I figure out g? I already know yh from before, so can I figure out g? And I do that just by putting my guess back in the equation. This may seem strange, sort of like a guessing and testing, but we do this all the time in differential equations. We say, well, maybe the solution looks something like this. Put it in the equation, see what happens. All right, let me do that. The linear operator applied to this particular solution is written here. The linear operator says differentiate and multiply by p. The derivative is now a product rule because I have a product of two functions. g and yh are both functions. So I get the derivative of one times the other and vice versa. And then the second term is just the function p times the function g times the function yh. Do remember that these are all functions. I'm not writing of t all the time um, just because it makes the notation a little bit cumbersome. So it's up to you to just remember that we have to find p and g and yh all to be functions. Notice these last two terms all have a g in them, so I'm going to factor a g out. And then I want to work with this last equation. Let me go to a new slide where I've written q on the left, but it's the same thing. Now, this term in brackets is just the operator L applied to yh. The operator L says differentiate and multiply by p. That's what's going on here. So this is L yh. But what is yh? It's the homogeneous solution, which means that lyh is equal to zero. That's what a homogeneous solution means. So this whole term just turns into zero. And what I'm left with is just these two terms. I can divide by yh to get this expression for g prime, and then I can integrate to get this expression for g. And that's what I wanted, because my guess for the particular solution was that the particular solution would be some function g times the homogeneous solution, and via that guess, I've now figured out what that varied parameter g needs to be. So let me put that all together. Um, yh is e to the negative integral p of t dt, so I can replace yh there. I can also replace yh here, and I can simplify this integral by writing e to the negative in the denominator as e to the positive in the numerator. So this is a general solution for a general form for the particular solution. We could solve different um, linear equations this way. We could figure out p and q, do these integrals, and just write down this particular solution. I'm going to eventually give you a nicer way to do this, but this is the theory. This is the general way to approach things. Notice this is sort of crazy. There's an integral inside another integral with an exponential in between. 
it's a bit bizarre. It's a strange thing to look at if you're not used to it. But hopefully, with some practice, we will actually get used to what's going on here. All right. How do we actually do these solutions? Well, let me think a little bit more about this particular solution. In this particular solution, before I integrate Q, I multiply this e to the integral p of dt. And if I multiplied by that exponential on both sides, well, then I could actually get rid of it on the left and put it on the right. And I would get e to the integral p t y p is the integral of e to the integral p of t q. I'm going to call this e to the integral p of t mu of t. This is the Greek letter mu. And it's going to be called the integrating factor. And it's essentially going to be the thing that we actually use to calculate the solutions of these differential equations. Notice if I differentiate this equation here, well, I'll differentiate on the right, this e to the integral p is mu, so the derivative of this product, and the derivative gets rid of the integral on the left, sorry, on the right, the left turns into the product, the integral on the right, uh, derivative gets rid of the integral, and I have mu q, so I get this expression. And I'm going to try and turn all of my linear differential equations into this expression. All right, that's a lot of theory, that's a lot of crazy symbols running around. Maybe you're feeling completely lost. Let me do some examples to try and ground you again. This is a linear differential equation. There's a derivative, there's y times some function, so p is 1 over t, and there's some function q. q is 2 e to the t. I could calculate the homogeneous by setting the q term to 0. It would be c e to the integral p, p is 1 over t. And I could get that the homogeneous would be c over t if I sort of simplify this all down. That's nice. That's useful. I'll mention that later because I want to know what this form is. But in terms of actually solving, what I care about is the integrating factor. So let me calculate the integrating factor. Mu is e to the integral p dt. p is the coefficient of y. So here, 1 over t is so e to the integral 1 over t. Integral 1 over t is logarithm of absolute value, so it's e to the ln absolute value t. And I'm going to write this just as t, not absolute value t. Why can I drop this absolute value? Well, it essentially comes down to domain. The logarithm is not defined at 0, so this doesn't work at t equals 0, and is split into pieces, a positive t and a negative t piece. When t is time, we're usually not going to care about negative time. So we're usually going to care about positive time. So I'm just going to assume that t is positive. If I do need to care about negative time, I'd have to deal with another case where there's a negative here to deal with the fact that I've got an absolute value. But by thinking about, sorry, by thinking about domains, I can, I can make this work. All right, that's my integrating factor. Integrating factor here is just t. So I take my inter original equation and multiply by the integrating factor. That's my technique. Calculate the integrating factor, multiply this. So I multiply here mu, here mu, and here mu. Mu is just t, so I get t's all the way across. And then the right side turns into a product rule. This will always happen. This is why the integrating factor works, is it turns the left side, I said right, my apologies, left side of the equation into a product. And then once the left side is a product, I can just integrate to solve because the integral will get rid of the derivative on the left, and then I just need to integrate on the right. I asked the computer for this integral, it gave me this expression, then I divide by, um, sorry, this should be a y, I divide by t to get this expression, and then this is my solution. My solution is 2 e to the t minus e to the t over t plus c over t. And you can see I already calculated the homogeneous solution. The homogeneous peeps pops up really nicely out of this. I actually didn't need to calculate it originally. It's there. It's the piece that's going to have the constant of integration in it. And this other piece is the particular solution, 2 e to the t minus e to the t over t. And I see this is undefined at t equals 0. So I'm going to assume this is just defined for positive t. That's the method. After all that crazy theory, it's actually not too bad. Calculate mu, multiply by mu, integrate, solve for y. Here's another example. This one is sort of set up with the coefficients as I started with a, b, and f. This one's homogeneous, which is nice. Um, if I divide through by t squared minus 9, I get uh, and put the ty on the right, I get this expression. 
and I divide by y, I can write this as a separable equation. So this one, I don't even need the integrating factor. Sometimes if I just care about the homogeneous solution, I can just go straight to the separable form. I integrate the left in y, integrate the right in t, and then this left is going to turn into a logarithm. I take the exponential to solve for y, so I'm going to get e to the integral of t over t squared minus 9. That integral is going to be a logarithm with a 1 half. Again, I'll write the e to the c out front as just a c, and I'll deal with this logarithm with the rules of logarithms right in this 1 half out front or as an exponent, which is going to make this into a square root. The exponential and the logarithm will cancel off. Um, and this negative will put this t squared minus 9 in the denominator. So in the end, the separable solution to this is just going to be y equals c over square root t squared minus 9. I can split this up into two ways depending on the absolute value. And again, I'm going to deal with this in domain. So both of these are solutions depending on the domain. One is a solution for t less than 3, one is a solution for t greater than 3. Example 2 shows me that the integrating factor is the general technique, but if I just have a homogeneous system, homogeneous equation, I can just go to treating it as a separable equation. All right, last me, let me do one more, and this one has a bit of a twist. Q is a piecewise function. Sometimes that happens. Um, it's really common, common to have piecewise functions like this, where this is a switch function. So something is on, and then after one unit of time, it turns off. There's lots of things that behave this way in applied mathematics, lots of switches. So we want to be able to model them. All right, so let me look at this. I'm going to have to deal with this in two cases. One case for t between 0 and 1, and one case for t larger than 1. So let me first deal with the case for t between 0 and 1. I calculate the integrating factor. The coefficient of y here is just 1. There's nothing else in front of y. So the integrating factor is e to the integral of p. p is 1, so e to the integral of 1, which is e to the t. So I multiply everything by e to the t. It's going to turn the left side into this product rule. So it's always going to turn the left side into the derivative of the integrating factor times y. You can always go straight to this step on the left. Derivative, integrating factor times y. And the right... I had 1 as q for this domain, so 1 times e to the t is just e to the t. Then I integrate both sides. e to the t is its own antiderivative. I'm going to add a constant of integration. I'm going to call this c1 because this only applies to part of the domain. I'll divide by e to the t to get this expression. So this is the solution for t between 0 and 1 using the integrating factor. I do the same thing for t greater than 1, where q is going to be 0. I'll do the integrating factor again. I could do it as separable. Much, might as well do the integrating factor again. The, multiplying by the integrating factor turns the left into this product rule derivative always. The right is multiplying by 0, so it remains 0. I integrate both sides. I get a constant on the right. I divide by e to the t to get e to the negative t. So going a little bit quickly, I get this solution for this other domain. And so my solution is likewise piecewise for the two pieces of the domain. And I could stop here with these two different constants of integration. But say I want this to be continuous. It's actually really common, even if I have a discontinuous piece of the equation, to still want a continuous solution. This happens since I could flip a switch, but I still want the change of the system to be continuous from before and after the switch. So let me think about making this continuous. So this is just an exercise of limit from the left and limit from the right. Limit from the left at t equals 1 is this. Limit from the right at t equals 1 is this. So I get these two limits, and these have to be the same. So I try and solve. I get this expression between c1 and c2. So I can use this to replace c2 with e plus c1 or c1 with c2 minus e, which is what I'm going to do here. And then since I, I boil this down to one constant by using this continuity condition, I'm just going to write it as c. So I get this expression by making sure that the limit from the left and the limit from the right line up for this function. And then that's a continuous solution with one parameter to this weird linear differential equation that had a piecewise q of t. And it's sort of remarkable that we can actually handle that but we can, and we want to, because it models something reasonable. It models a switch. We'll see more of these later in the course as well.